Agriculture's got some major challenges that it faces, and uh, I can't think of anybody better than Bob Jones Jr. of Chef's Garden to come in and lay out a different way of doing things, and they take it to another level. So we're going to learn a lot from Bob and uh, really excited about the future. <music> Bob, I am just so excited to be visiting with you. I uh, came across one of your interviews. Uh, I was aware of Chef's Garden, but one of your interviews with you specifically talking about a whole host of things, and it just resonated with me uh, from the cancer to the agriculture, regenerative, just taking everything to another level. But what I wanted to hit on first is like, what is Chef's Garden? What is separating you from kind of this uh, more of a conventional means of production? And uh, why why do you do what you do? Logan, thank you very much. I appreciate it. We're very passionate about what we do here at the farm. Uh, we love to talk about it. We love to find like-minded folks who are just as passionate about regenerative agriculture as we are. Uh, our family has been in the fresh produce business for over 60 years. My father started out growing vegetables in 1960. Uh, my brother Lee and I have worked with him. We've assembled an amazing team of people over the last 40 years. Um, but just about growing vegetables that look good, taste good, and are good for you. We were very fortunate many, many years ago. My father was in the wholesale produce business. Uh, his farm reached about 1,200 acres of fresh market vegetables in the early 80s. He was a wholesale only. He was selling to grocery chains like Kroger, Big Bear, Piggly Wiggly, Winn-Dixie, anywhere east of the Rockies. We would load 10 to 15 trailer loads of produce a day during the peak season of June, July, August, September. And my brother and I were were late teen, early 20s during that time frame, helping as much as we could. If you know much about traditional economics and agriculture, that was a time that we called the farm crisis during the early 80s. Traditional economic model is that you borrow operating capital in the winter so that you have money to buy seed and fertilizer, etc. You farm all year long and hope you can pay that back. Then you go in in the winter again and massage the books the best you can and borrow operating capital for the subsequent growing season. Uh, it's the model that's still used today, very prevalent model. And, and I guess I should back up a little bit. We talk about American agriculture being broken both economically and agronomically. And we learned both of those lessons kind of the hard way. So that economic model, my dad's business, his last operating note in 1983, the interest rate was 23%. So he was borrowing money at 23% for his operating note. Mm -hmm. His largest customer was Kroger, and they were a 120-day pay. So that meant we would grow, harvest, package, and ship to them, and then we'd wait for our money. So we were borrowing money at a very high interest rate. We were essentially loaning it to the grocery store for zero, and we wondered why that didn't work. It was a very simple economics 101 lesson. At the same time that uh, we were getting this great economics lesson, we were also seeing, and dad was seeing, that it was requiring greater and greater amounts of inputs to produce the same or reducing amounts of outputs. So agronomically, there was a problem as well. We just weren't able to produce as much yield as we were previously. Now, there's, there's certainly uh, growing season differences, um, rainfall amounts per year. We, we're very fortunate. We have about 35 inches of rainfall per year here. We're on old sandy lake bottom soil, so we have a great area to grow fresh produce. We went from 1,200 acres in 1983 to six acres in 1984. We just, our, our bank encouraged us to find a different advocation. Uh, and so the economics 101 was high volume, low margin, wait for your money. We started over with a roadside stand and some farmer's markets. 
Now, farmers markets weren't quite as prevalent in the early 80s as they are today. However, it was low volume, higher margin, cash. Cash is king. So we were able to substitute. We, the only thing we knew how to do was to grow vegetables. We had to find a model that would allow us to continue to do the only thing we knew how to do. We saw this happen across the country in the early 80s. A lot of farm sales. Um, some really, really good people lost their entire livelihoods and multi-generational family farms. Um, and it was just a very, very heartbreaking time. And unfortunately, we're seeing a little bit of that rear its head today. Um, a lot of issues around mental health and suicide in agriculture. Um, a lot of heavy economic pressure and agronomic pressure. Um, you, you, you just see that uh, repeating itself because we haven't quite fixed it yet. We think regenerative agriculture is really the answer from several fronts to allow folks to grow healthier food, to reduce the amount of inputs over time, uh, you can re you can increase profit by either reducing your expenses or increasing your revenue. The greatest way to do that is to do both at the same time. Um, and I guess that probably leads me to one of the things I'd like to make a point of emphasis for the growers that are listening to us today. I think the time of just being a pure farmer is gone. Yeah. We all love to farm. Most farmers have iron deficiency because we love to work with equipment. We don't want to talk about marketing. We don't want to talk about business succession. Uh, we don't want to talk about tax planning. We just want to kick tires and, and run equipment up and down the field because that's what we enjoy and that's what we're passionate about. I don't know how many farmers market farmers I've heard say, farmers markets wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for all the customers. <laughs> because mostly they're very passionate about growing but they, they're not people, people. Um, farming in the United States today, we have an amazing story to tell. We're just not good storytellers. And so folks like yourself who are pure marketers and understand how to tell a good story, it's not that you're trying to, all you're trying to do is to convey to people what agriculture is really all about. Less than 1% of the population of this country has a direct connection to the farm anymore. And so now agritourism has exploded because folks who do remember the farm want their kids to have a little taste of that. Yeah. So that's a piece of what we're doing. Bob, I'll, let's, let's dive into that a little bit because that was a big connection point for me because so we started as a little roadside stand selling mm -hmm. the produce that was grown by my grandparents and, and, and your parents. So that, that was the game changer that just started everything, right? Like it was, it was local. It was very, very seasonal. I think we were open like two months uh, out of the year back then. So why did that shift have such a positive impact on, on what you did, uh, your dad did with taking the, the business in another direction? Sure. It's a great question, and it is a huge part of our moderate success. And that is, while we were at farmer's markets, we, we grew to the point where we went to 15 different farmer's markets every week. Mm -hmm. And we had a family member at each one of those markets. My mom went to a market. My grandmother was at a market. My dad won. My brother won. Myself won. Um, but it was, it was direct marketing, and it was immediate customer feedback. So customer feedback is always beneficial. It's just not always fun because when you screw it up and you don't meet their expectations, they're very quick to let you know about that. Yes. But it also gives you an opportunity. It's a golden opportunity to take that feedback and react to it very quickly and then continue this continuous loop of improvement. So while we were at farmer's markets, we actually happened to meet some chefs. There were chefs in the Cleveland area that were so disgruntled with the quality of produce they could get from their normal purveying chain in the late 80s, early 90s, that they actually started early on Saturday morning going to the farmer's market to buy produce to use on their menus Saturday night. And then they started ordering more and more product from us. And over a period of about five years, we were doing farmer's markets and then restaurants. 
And the restaurant business grew to the point where we had to have a, a conversation about, okay, which one of these avenues, marketing channels, are we going to pursue? Because I'm not sure we could do both. And we had a family meeting around the card table in the barn. And I don't know about at your house, but at, at our house, I had a vote, my brother had a vote, and my dad had three votes. And we, we talked about which should we do. And we all said, let's do farmer's markets. And then it got to dad because he always voted last because he would take consensus from the entire group. And then he would, he would kind of meld that all together. He would take the viewpoints of everyone and say, okay, oh, here's what we're going to do. And he pounded his fist on the table and he said, we're going to take care of chefs. And he said, Lee, you're going to go find every chef you can find. And you're going to tell them that we're going to we're going to grow prescriptively for them. We want to know from them, what do you want us to grow for you? We will custom grow for your restaurant. Tell us what you want us to grow for you and we will grow it. In the 90s, we went to Ohio State Extension Service and we said, we've got chefs that told us that they would like us to grow radicchio for them. And the Extension Service told us it can't be grown here. It's native to Italy. We don't have the climate. You can't do it here. We said, okay, thank you very much. Please tell every other farmer that asked you that the same thing. And we started growing radicchio. And the chefs fell in love with it. And they introduced us to another chef who introduced us to another chef. You're, you're growing lettuce. Could you grow tomatoes? Oh, you're growing lettuce and you're growing tomatoes. Would you grow basil? And so that lo- those line item extensions added on and added on and added on. Today, we grow over 800 different varieties of edible plants. Everything from microgreens to edible flowers, uh, salad greens, potatoes. We have 100 varieties of heirloom tomatoes that we grow. And it's all been because there were chefs or home consumers now who have asked us to grow specific varieties for them. We even had chefs bringing us seed from their home country. Here was my mother's favorite sauce tomato variety. Would you grow this variety for me? And we'd clean up the seed and do some genetic selection. And now we have some varieties of of tomatoes um, that a local family brought from Italy with them 100 years ago. Um, And telling that story about how we're growing it, what we're growing, how we grow it, and and the relationships. The relationships, I think, are the key uh, from the very beginning. Direct marketing, that immediate customer feedback, and developing relationships with internal and external customers. Those folks that work with us every day here on the farm, obvious relationship is the folks that are buying the product from us, but also our vendor relationships. We want and strive to create win-win relationships at every level. Relationships, and I've heard you talk about this before, when you are intentional about your relationships and you understand and are intentional about making every relationship you have a win-win relationship. Most people look at relationships as extractional, where one win, one person wins and one person loses. Those types of relationships exist everywhere. We, we all can, and can cite examples of them. They're very short-lived because yep. it doesn't matter whether it's, it's a customer and a vendor or an employee and an employer, or a husband and a wife. If it's not a win-win relationship, somebody's winning, somebody's losing, the relationship does not last. And so going back to my concept of you can no longer just be a farmer. You have to be a business person who farms and marrying in. I think that part of what we've been able to accomplish is a direct result of meeting and reading and studying people like Gabe Brown, people like John Kemp, um, Carrie Reams, Dan Scow, all of these folks who are who were the early adapters um, uh, of, of regenerative agriculture and blending that with people like John Maxwell and Max Licato and um, Simon Sinek, Pat Lencioni, um, People, so from the business world and then marrying those topics in with regenerative agriculture, regenerative agriculture is at its term, at its core about regenerating ourselves 
regenerating the land and regenerating our communities. All very, very possible when done intentionally. Love that. Agree, agree wholeheartedly. That's, you know, that's, that's the whole, whole mission. And why, when I, when I heard your, that podcast interview, I was like, we've, we've got to get together because, because Bob gets it. And not only do you get it, you've been doing it for so long, right? Your whole group and, and y'all are, y'all are doing some things that are absolutely incredible by going above and beyond. So on, on that direct to consumer, what you were talking about with the farmers, they're they're actually business business people that farm, right? What we have seen work so well for our model is that we will partner with a farmer to take on those responsibilities that kind of give give the the farmer the ick, right? They don't have to go set up at a farmer's market. We'll buy the whole crop. So we we plan out before the season, hey, if you'll grow these varieties of, of heirloom tomatoes or these strawberries or, or these squash, whatever it is, we will buy that whole whole harvest. And we are responsible for retailing it through the market, partnering with chefs, doing that distribution, or even the value-added things. So strawberries, jams, jellies, or cucumbers, pickles, tomatoes, salsa, whatever we have to do. And that has been so beautiful of a – such a beautiful partnership because they just light up. They're like, we get to farm, right? We we found the right partner. So I think that you're spot on with what you're saying, but I think there's also another opportunity to be able to teach marketers to be able to teach these retail outlets these farm stands they don't have to be so complicated and we can build out more farmers by helping them right like almost like a farmer's partner and so i i love that you said that one one more thing that really just drawn to what y'all do farmers and chefs don't understand each other in a in a general uh, terms, right? Because a lot of the chefs, they, they get on the, you know, the big distributors, uh, you know, Cisco or U.S. Foods or whatever, and they, they place an order, right? Where does that come from? They have no idea. And, and a lot of them, they don't care, uh, right, wrong, or indifferent. And the farmer doesn't understand that food service has got to be consistent, right? They've got to be able to produce a menu that people keep coming back for. It can't change every single time. And so how have you been able to connect the two worlds that are vastly, vastly different. Well, I, I can, you're, you're right. This taking two different worlds and bringing them together really was, my father was the genius behind this business model. We lost him in 2020, um, but he had, um, th- there, there was an evolution of the farm going from the wholesale to the restaurant business the restaurants were very, very good to us. They taught us about the food business. Most farmers today, our contention is, ourselves included, do not understand that they grow food. They grow a commodity. If they don't have a direct connection to the end consumer and they're interjecting their their product into a commodity market stream, there's no feedback loop. Uh, it just it's just not there. It's non-existent. Even in fresh produce, if you're selling to Walmart, you don't get to talk to the customer. Understanding how we can differentiate was a matter of survival. So how do we differentiate? How are we different than Cisco uh, and U.S. Foods? Because you're dealing directly with the farm. You can actually come to the farm and meet the person who's harvesting, growing and harvesting the tomatoes for your restaurant. We, you can come to the farm. The chefs, uh, prior to COVID, we had 800 chefs visit the farm annually, wow. every year. We built, as you can, t- I don't know whether you can see the logo on my sweater. It's the chef's garden. There's the farmer. There's the chef. They are a huge part of our business. They have taught us the food business. They've been very, very patient. The first chef who really drove that home for us was a chef by the name of Jean-Louis Paladin. Jean-Louis Paladin was a French trained chef at the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. And he came to the United States and he, in essence, said, your produce is garbage. We have good produce in Europe. And what I have to work with here is garbage. And he taught us. We sat down and we were willing to listen. He heard our feelings and we were okay with that. 
And he told us exactly what he wanted. And then we went about meeting and exceeding his expectations to the very best of our ability. And he introduced us to other chefs who introduced us to other chefs. We now sell to chefs in 50 states and 17 countries. Um, And it worked really, really well until COVID shut all the restaurants down. That allowed us to create an opportunity to, to develop a home delivery model. So we now ship directly to home consumers in all 50 states. Um, It's a little bit different model. It's a lot of the same produce that four and five star restaurants are using delivered directly to your home. We were growing for flavor. Chefs have been unbelievably consistent in their demands of us. You mentioned that consistency piece. Our mantra is a, a consistent supply of high quality product. That's what chefs demand. So we asked chefs over the years, what do you need from us? Very, very consistent. Flavor, aesthetics, flavor, shelf life, more flavor. If you don't have flavor, you don't have anything in the kitchen. They can make a great meal with great ingredients. They can make a lousy meal with great ingredients, but you can never make a great meal with lousy ingredients. It doesn't work that way. You got to have great ingredients to start with. So they taught us about those things and about how important quality was. Many chefs years and years ago were forced into a situation where they had to accept inferior quality because they could get it consistently. They have farmers come up with this beautiful load of green beans and the chef would say, oh my gosh, that's, those are the nicest green beans I've ever had. He puts it on the menu. His customers fall in love with it. And two weeks later, he's out. Well, I'll have more in three weeks. Oh my gosh, the chef's pulling his hair out because it was the supply was in and out and in and out and in and out. A consistent supply of high quality product is what a chef has to have in order to take care of his customers. So again, understanding our customers' needs and then going a level deeper and understanding our customers' customers' needs. What do they want? Most of the restaurants that we sell to, quite honestly, are places I cannot afford to dine at. There is a high amount of expendable income in a small percentage of our population. Dining has become a form of entertainment. And so that's where, and we were very, very fortunate and are continue to be fortunate to work with some unbelievably world-class culinarians who create magic and art with the food that we grow. It's a synergistic work. We want to have them come to the farm because we learn a lot more from them than they learn from us. 20 years ago, dad said, you know, uh, these chefs come to the farm and they get really excited and passionate when they walk through the greenhouse, they walk through the field, they walk through the packing house. They want to cook right now. So we built them a kitchen in the middle of the farm. We have an 11,000 square foot industrial kitchen in the middle of the farm. And they will go through the fields and pick and harvest. And then they go immediately into the kitchen and start to create menu concepts to take back to their restaurants where they work. They can bring their front of house team and do training. They can bring their back of the house team and do training. We do corporate events there. Um, It's just, it's called the Culinary Vegetable Institute. And it is the chef and farmer concept. The chef and the farmer working together, learning from each other understanding each other's craft and their trade so that we can better help each other succeed to a greater level. It's a true synergy where one plus one equals three. Thank you for joining us on Sewing Prosperity. Be sure to follow along across the social media platforms, including YouTube, and be sure to go to sewingprosperity.com.